I haven't read the whole article yet. I, I don't know all the details of it. The FIM pulling out of Supercross, I, I never quite understood why they were there. Is it so they can call it FIM World Championship? I don't understand that because it's not a world championship because they only race in America. Now, granted, you know, a lot of people from Europe and Australia, whether it's Lawrence Brothers or Ferrandis from from, uh, from France, or of course, I get that, and it's an international field. But why they call it a world championship event, I never understood that anyway. But what I can imagine is that that uh, the FIM. Or Feld is probably paying a, a huge amount to the FIM for them to be a sanctioning body of that, and I bet you they don't have to pay that anymore. I don't know. I, I want to read more about it before I say anything about it on the show or really discuss it with anybody. So. everyone. You're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A, and I'm your host, Joe Abadi. Thank you for joining me this evening, and thank you, Chelsea, Susie, and Jordan, for helping me put the show together tonight. Let's get down to the starting line, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what's coming up on the show. The starting line is, of course, brought to you by Motion Pro. For all your specialized tools, cables, and controls, be sure to visit Motion Pro online. And the next time, try this segment. We've got something we showed you before, but we're going to show it to you again. I think you're going to like it. In the Moto Showcase, a really nice 1979 YZ125 that was sent in to us by Mark Trout. Here's the problem. You've got burned side panels due to your pipe not fitting correctly. We've got a remedy for that. What's it worth? 1974 Montesta 250, a beautiful motorcycle that recently sold in Arizona. We're going to be taking a look at that. Just how I see it, the Hopetown reunion was this weekend. I'll tell you a little bit more about when, uh, what went on there and why you should be attending stuff like that. Share the show. Don't forget to keep sharing it, whether you're on YouTube or you're on Facebook. We will have a random share giveaway winner a little bit later on. If you're sharing it on, uh, on YouTube, be sure to comment Motion Pro. We're going to give away a nice sticker pack like this, compliments of Vinco. Don't forget, keep sharing the show. YouTube channel is going great. You can see all the interviews that we've done at Vintage Motocross Radio, plus all the shows that we've done here on Vintage Motocross Q&A. So please subscribe to our channel. There'll be an alert like this. It'll tell you when we're live, and you can watch uh, you can watch the show live or catch all the reruns, which are great too. And how are the experts? How are the pros watching the show? They're sitting back on their couch, looking at their big screen TV while they comment from their phone. It's a great way to watch the show, and that's the way the experts are doing it, watching the big screen commenting on the phone. We love to hear from you. 
keep those letters coming in, all the emails, all the messages. We really, really look forward to them. It's a great way to let me know what kind of bike you have and that you want to put on the show so we can feature it here in the Moto Showcase. Or if you just have questions or comments, please keep them coming in. It's a big part of the show, especially when we do the uh, Here's the Problem segment or some of the other things that we do too. So I appreciate the letters you send me. Keep them coming in. As always, I want to thank our sponsors, Vinco, Racer X, Motion Pro, Preston Petty Products, Sunrise Vapor Blasting, Golan Industries, Full Circle Racing, and Northwest Makeup CZ. On the next time try this segment tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about sticker placement and how you'll be able to move a sticker around a little bit if you follow these simple instructions. A lot of times when people buy graphics, on the logo, it might be a little thinner toward the end like there is on this Fast Guy sticker. When I say thinner, I'm talking about the logo itself. In other words, if you had to stick it in place and you wanted to move it, you might not have much luck peeling it back off and trying to move it again. But I'm going to show you a little technique that I've used over the years, and I think you're going to like it, and it's going to work for you. Before placing your sticker on, you can use some Windex. Soapy water works pretty well, too. Windex works just as well. Just spray a little on the tank, just like this. When you peel away your sticker, and you can see that sticker is pretty thin. You can put your sticker in place, but now you can actually move it, just like you see here. So, you can put it exactly where you want it. And what I like to use is a sponge, just like this, a new sponge. Some people will recommend using a credit card or a squeegee like this where you can apply putty. I don't really like to use that. You run the risk of scratching up the sticker and maybe even peeling it up from the edge. So, I keep the sponge a little moist. And I just keep wiping away while trying to keep the sticker in place. I wipe away the excess from underneath. And you keep doing that nice and easy. Sponge works really well this way for two reasons. Number one, it's nice and soft. It's not going to scratch the sticker or your paint. Number two, it's going to absorb any of the water or Windex that you have underneath the new sticker you just put on. You can move the sticker wherever you like. It also works on any type of graphics, any type of sticker you're going to be putting on your tank. And that's my tip for this week on Next Time Try This. In the Motor Showcase tonight, which is sponsored by Preston Petty Products, we're going to be taking a look at a 1979 Yamaha YZ125 that was sent in to us by Mark Trout. Now, Mark bought this bike several years ago, and he really wanted to do a great job on it. And the best way to do that is to make sure you get all your parts together before you start your restoration. It took Mark nearly two years to find everything he wanted to make this bike the way it looks today. He did an excellent job on refinishing it. He rebuilt everything on the engine, replaced all the bearings, steels, gaskets. He did a beautiful job on the paint. And the only thing that really is an OEM on the bike is a DG head, which I think is a really, really great addition, a beautiful period correct addition to that, uh, that DG gold radial head. Uh, of course, very, very reminiscent of those days when those shops were making some great items for that bike. Other than that, Mark Trout did an outstanding job on the restoration, and I want to thank him for sending it into us so we can all see it here at Vintage Motocross Q&A. Mark Trout, if you're watching, please send me your mailing address, and I'll get you a nice gift compliment of Preston Petty products. Thanks, Mark. And speaking of Preston Petty products, this week's special for just $259 in a three-piece set. You've got the integrated tail light in the rear fender, the mutter rear fender. You've got the mutter front, and you've also got the integrated headlight number plate combination. This is a really great way to jazz up your little enduro bike or dual purpose bike. Just $259 this week at Preston Petty Products. They've got a lot of great items there and a lot of different items that they bundle. Bundles like this, where there's fenders, number plates, fenders and grips, fenders, and some great Preston Petty jerseys as well. So get over to PrestonPettyProducts.com and see what's available to you. Here's a bike I did with Preston Petty Fenders on it, Nobby Shop International. When they were made, they did come with Preston Petty Fenders. And there they are, in yellow, a mutter front and a mutter rear. Here's the problem segment tonight is, of course, brought to you by Motion Pro. Let's get to the first question, Jordan. 
Tony Morello, I'm trying to match the tank paint for the 1975 KX250 or 400. PJ1 isn't the greatest match. What would you suggest? Well, the first thing I think we should do is talk about the fact that there were, I think, three different KX greens at one time. Now, the one that is in this can right here is more of a 76 metal flake color. That's not the one that you want to use. And while some people may have a little disagreement with me here, I think the 74 green was even a little bit of a lighter shade than the 75. 250 and 400, but that's a discussion for another day. What you want to use as a perfect match is the PPG 2115 AMC Big Green. If you go to an auto body supply shop and you give them that code, PPG 2115 AMC Big Green, I think it's called Big Bad Green, in fact, that's going to be the perfect match that you need for your 1974 or 75 KX 250 and 400. Thanks for the question. Dave Irwin, poor fitting aftermarket pipes as well as reproduction plastic panels can be a problem when it comes to melting the panels. Any tips on remedying this? Yeah, I do. And the first thing you want to do is make sure that your pipe fits properly. Now, there are aftermarket pipe builders out there, and I'm not going to name names, but some of them do not fit no matter what happens, okay? No matter how you put it on the bike with your stock mounts, sometimes they're, they're a little tweaked, and you may have a problem with the stinger sticking out if it goes behind a number, a number plate on the right side of your bike. Also, if you're using a, an aftermarket silencer, it could, it could throw things off just a little bit. So the first thing you wanna do, make sure your pipe fits uh, loosely in your cylinder, that it's not twisted and, and doesn't have some flexibility to it. There's a reason why there's insulators on those little mounts that go to your frame and that there's rubber in them. That pipe needs to move a little bit because of the vibration. Now, sometimes the pipe may fit properly and it's not tight against the frame and it does have some movement, but when you go to put the side panel on, you wind up with a situation like we see right here. This happens to be a modern bike. I need to get a picture of what exactly the problem was uh, on this question, but this is the result when you don't have your number plate spaced away from that exhaust pipe, okay? So you can put some washers behind it. That may take it away a little bit. Making sure that that pipe and silencer are lined up correctly, that would be another way to guarantee or at least make sure you're close to the panel not burning. Now, if all else fails, what you can get is some aluminum heat treat uh, 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 foil tape like this. Hot rod guys use this. They wrap it around their exhaust pipe. Some street bike guys use it as well. It's to keep the heat in the pipe. That's what they want on hot rods and some street bikes. In your situation, you may not want to keep the heat in that stinger, although it might not be a bad idea, but I think the application is going to be a little tough for you to put that tape on the stinger. What you can do is make sure everything's lined up the way I told you. Make sure the number plate maybe is spaced out just a little bit. Then go to either a hot rod shop or actually any auto supplies place may sell this. You get this tape and it has a sticky back. You can put it alongside the back of your side panel and that's going to give you that added protection you need. So those are the three things you need to look out for. The pipe lining up correctly, the side panel being spaced a little bit, and as a little added protection, you get some of that heat foil tape with the sticky back, put it on the back of your number plate, and uh, that should help quite a bit. I spoke with Keith Geisner a little bit yesterday, and he had a great little tip that he wanted to share with us here at Vintage Motocross Q&A, and the tip is that Kenda is now making a vintage replica tire. And this tire in particular, as I look close to it, and they show it on a 74 CR 125, does look like a real close replica to a Bridgestone. So in the past, when people have had questions about tires on the shell, you've often heard me recommend V-Brand rubber, a great one, Dunlop K990s, Dunlop, one of the most trusted names in tires. But now you have a third choice with Kenda. So I want to thank Keith Geisner for sending that little tip in to us. Also, thanks, Keith, for being a sponsor of the show for a long, long time now, giving us your book, Finding Number 49, to give away the first Wednesday of every month. And that Wednesday is coming up. Next Wednesday, we'll have it on the show. Finding Number 49. Thanks, Keith. Hi, I'm Tommy Croft, and you're watching Vintage Motocross Q&A with Joe Abadi. We'll be right back with my dear friend, Joe. Oh, Hi, I'm Jeff with Motion Pro, introducing you to the Masterlink Press Tool. Now, the Masterlink Press Tool is an innovative addition to our wide variety of chain tools here at Motion Pro. And what makes this tool so unique is that it both presses on and presses off Masterlink side plates. It's designed to be used 
with all 50 series clip style links and performs the job very easily. The Masterlink press tool is constructed with a billet aluminum body and hardened steel pins for long lasting durability. It's affordably priced at $28.99 and is available from your favorite dealers nationwide. In the What's It Work segment tonight, which is sponsored by Full Circle Racing, we'll be telling you a little bit more about Full Circle Racing in just a minute. But right now, what's it worth? We're going to be taking a look at a 1974 Montessa VR250, recently sold in Arizona on uh, June 18th. I'll read to you what the bike, I'm sorry, what the description is. And this is, of course, the part of the show where we encourage you to put in the comments what you think this bike sold for. So once I start reading, you could uh, put your guesses in, take your best guess. And in the description, it says that this bike was sold in 1975 at CNG Cycle Sales in Salt Lake City, Utah. The bike was then brought to Midvale, Utah, and the owner registered it and just wrote it very, very little. He did replace some things on it, which I found a little peculiar, being he wrote it so little. But some of the original items that are not on the bike are the grips, the NJB shocks, the Makuni Carb, a custom pipe, and silencer, plastic replica fenders, and tires. Items that will come with the bike are the original front fiberglass fender, a bin carb, the OEM chain guard, the OEM kickstand assembly, an extra coil, the fiberglass front number plate, the fiberglass airbox, the parts manual, the number plate decals, and the decal stripes. It does have the original title. So when the second person bought this bike who recently sold it, he never changed the title. So the next person that's going to buy it will appear to be the second owner of the bike. He was able to find out all this because the original title had the name of the person on it, and he did some research on it and actually spoke to the, uh, the person's wife. Anyway, the bike's in extremely nice condition. There is a scuff on the back of the seat, which was repaired with a little silicone. The tank stripe decal on the upper right has a small piece missing. There are only 2,400 of these bikes ever produced, and only 800 of, of them were imported to America. This one is a very nice example, and I would consider it a survivor if the parts were put back on that do come with the bike, or if someone really wanted to put the time in, they could certainly change it back and restore it to a concourse restoration. And I agree with that. So what do you think this bike sold for? 3,500, 45, 6,000. The bike sold for $5,000. And I think that was a pretty great deal um, considering all the OEM parts that come with it and the aftermarket parts would probably be valuable to sell afterward. I'm a little confused about why someone uh, the first owner of the bike took those things off and then didn't ride the bike very much. But look, after 50 years, there's a lot of things that can't be explained when it comes to old motorcycles. That's the story that was uh, given to us on eBay. And there's the bike. So 5,000 bucks, 74 VA 250. The Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page is still growing every day. I'm approving people there, and they're really getting a lot of use out of the page. Over 16,000 members strong, over six years old. If you've got a bike that you want to sell and you're wondering how much that bike is worth, go and post it there, the Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page, and you can have a discussion about it. The same way if you're looking to buy a bike, post it there with the price that someone wants to sell it for, and you'll get some real helpful advice from some really great bunch of guys that are there. Also, thousands of albums with pictures of bikes in there of sales from auctions and private sales. Go join up today. Vintage Motocross Buyers and Sellers Price Guide page. That segment is, of course, brought to you by Full Circle Racing and the special Still Rolls with Tom McAllister. Powder coating hubs, disassembling them, bead blasting, masking them, cleaning them all up, making them like new again for just 50 bucks a hub, $10 more for the brake plate. That's just for gloss black and matte black if you want a custom color that's 20 time $20 one-time fee. So get a hold of Tom McAllister at Full Circle Racing. Get your one-stop shop. Spokes, nipples, rims, lacing, and truing for both vintage and modern. Full Circle Racing Limited. Have you ever heard of, this is a segment that is first brought to you by Sunrise Vapor Blasting. Have you ever heard of an ESO? An ESO. I'll tell you a little bit about it. ESO motorcycles were designed by engineer Jaroslav Samandel and built in Czechoslovakia at the Jawa CZ factory. Though the engine was originally designed by Samandel for Speedway, it was an exact copy of the British JAP or JAP engine. Samandel designed the S45 motocross engine. It was called S45 because that was how many horsepower it actually put out. On the then new unit construction concept, 
1957. Before that, they all used Jap engine, and starting in 1948, uh, the Jap engine had already been over 20 years old. So Samandel wanted to come up with something that was a little bit different, and he built this replica of this engine. Three ESL engines were available, 250, 350, and 500 cc's. All were dry sump, and the interesting thing about them was that uh, they, they all had straight cut gears and a crank that actually spun backwards for whatever reason. ESOLs were also limited production machines that ended up in the hands of many club racers and GP riders in Europe. Uh, ESO translates to the word ace in typical Czech fashion. The ESO came with a complete spare kit set of a clutch, a carburetor, and a lot of other components. The ESO was taller, longer, and heavier than most British four strokes at the time, and did lack in handling just a little bit. However, with that longer chassis and the heavy gross weight, that's what uh, really, really made it handle not so well. The engines were so well, well regarded that Swede Sten London used an ESO engine in a Lido frame to win the world championship in 1961, while fellow Swede and world champion Bill Nilsson stuffed an ESO engine into a Rickman Matisse frame in 1964. With a better chassis like that, the Czechoslovakian handling problems had all but disappeared. But in 1964, ESO was absorbed, as they say, in Czechoslovakia by the Jawa company. ESO was doing really, really well. And uh, in a world of socialism at that time, they wanted Jawa to absorb all the sales that were uh, being done by ESO. So ESO was discontinued and Jawa went on as we know it today. So there you have it. Next time somebody asks if you ever heard of an ESO, you can tell them, yep, I heard all about it. Sunrise Vapor Blasting, still doing a great job for us and for so many other people as well. Whether it's aluminum, cast, steel, no matter what it is, it could be for your boat, car, or plane. Send it over to Mark Farias or Sunrise Vapor Blasting. He'll put it in his tank just like this. That part will come back cleaner than new with no change to the profile of the metal. And whether you have some attachments on there, whether they be brass or copper, they can't be removed. Mark will clean it all up. It'll look like brand new, just like the inside of this carburetor right here. I want to thank Mark Farias and Sunrise Vapor Blasting for being a sponsor of the show. And uh, if you get a moment, go check them out online. We're going to take a commercial break. Don't forget to keep sharing the show, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube. When we come back, we have a random share giveaway winner. It's going to get a nice sticker pack like this. Compliments of Vinco. Classic and vintage dirt bikes are more than a hobby. It's not just about the ride. It's about the work that goes in. The work that keeps you connected to the ride. It's about bringing the bike back to life. And doing it with your own hands. It's about the adrenaline and adventure. And when it comes to putting all the pieces together, only Vinco knows the bikes and parts the way you do. Vinco, keep the ride going. A lot of great products over there at Vinco. As promised, the random share giveaway winner tonight is Aaron Pitts. Aaron Pitts. If you're still watching the show, please contact me, inbox me, send me a message, get me your address, and I'm going to get you a nice sticker pack. Compliments of Vinco. Keep the ride going. Aaron Pitts. You're tonight's random share giveaway winner. In the Just How I See It segment tonight, I was uh, really, really excited about attending an amazing event down in Simi Valley this weekend. It was, of course, the Hopetown Reunion, and uh, that happened on Sunday, June 27th. What made it absolutely spectacular was the venue that they had it in. It was at the Hummingbird Nest Ranch in Simi Valley. It was, uh, of course, organized by the mayor of Simi Valley, but you may know him better as a Yamaha factory rider. His name is Keith Mashburn. He did a great job of assembling hundreds of bikes and an amazing cast of people and wonderful crew were there to put this whole thing together, including Sue Fish, who was the Hopetown class winner in 1974. Sue was there and so many other greats as well. And it was exciting to see how many people really, really cherished that moment of being together after this big lockdown COVID thing over the last 18 months. So if you've got 
some events coming up in your area. Uh, look, here, you talk about legends, John Rice, and, of course, Preston Petty. Preston Petty was out there, drove himself out there, and uh, it was great to see people like that. But, as I was saying, if you have some things going on in your area, get out there, take your family out, go out and support every every project you can uh, as far as a race goes or motorcycle shows, and let's keep this thing going. That last picture was a great shot of Eddie Mulder over here. We've got Sonny Nutter and a big vintage motocross enthusiast. You may know him from Storage Wars. Uh, Barry Weiss was on hand as well. So there's uh, Doug Grant and, of course, Greaves rider Jim Wilson. So many people were out there having a great time with each other, including Brad Lackey, Donnie Hansen, and so many more. And it was just a wonderful event. We are going to be bringing you some video of this in the near future. We did see Preston Petty's electric bike there. Once we get some time, we can get the, uh, the footage edited. We'll be talking about this more again. But I just wanted to share with you how excited people were to see each other and how grateful everyone seemed to be to get out there at an event to see the old bikes. And I'm encouraging everybody else to do that if you have something going on near you. And that's just how I say it. This Week in Motocross History is, of course, brought to you by Racer X Magazine, available on your newsstand and online now. Racer X, don't forget to look at our ad in the pages in the back with the vendors, Racer X Magazine, great coverage on all types of events. And This Week in Motocross History. It's 1979. Marty Tripes wins Red Bud. Marty Tripes scored a 250 win over Bob Hanna and Steve Wise at Red Bud. In the 500cc class, it was Danny Laporte taking a win despite of not winning either moto. Danny went two and two, but he did better than Rick Burgett, who went one and five, and Mike Bell, who went six and one. I thought this was interesting that I bring this up this weekend in the uh, MX history segment because Red Bud is this Saturday, a great track deep in history. First race was there in 1973, first national in 1974. And they've got a section there called La Rocco's Leap, which everyone enjoys. In fact, in the comments section right now, can you think of some tracks that have sections of them that are named after riders, things like La Rocco's Leap? I bet you two or three come to mind immediately. Put it in the comments. I'd like to see what you got to say. But Stripes was the winner in 79. 1985, David Bailey wins the US GP. It's the second time he's won, but this time it was uh, the 500 GP at Carlsbad. This race is also why they really started to call David the little professor. When they came out of the gate at the start of this race, Ron Lachine was on fire, and he really didn't look like he was going to be stopped in that moto. But little by little, through every turn, picking up a half a second here and there, by the end of the first moto, it was David Bailey who did come out victorious, just grinding away methodical laps one after the other. In the second moto, it was the same thing. Lachine came out like a guy possessed and just looked like he was running away. And little by little, once again, David Bailey worked his way through the pack, picking up time everywhere. Little Professor turned one and one that day at the 1985 USGP. And talk about competition. It wasn't just running Lachine. Think about this. Also in that race were George Jobay, David Thorpe, and Eric Gaboris. Chobay, five-time world champion, David Thorpe, three-time champion in the 500cc class, and Eric Gaboris, five-time world champion in 125, 250, and 500. And that day, David Bailey beat them all. Bested them all, not beat it, bested. 1982, Billy Lyles goes two and two. In one of his best rides of his career, American rider Billy Lyles swept all the motos in the 1992 British 500 Grand Prix at Hawkstone aboard a Johnson Honda CR500. Lyles, who hailed from Georgia, had been racing in Europe since the early 80s. This particular win caught the eye of Team USA manager Roy Jansen as he was running the show and the Grand Prix team for Europe at that time. With many top Americans passing on a chance to race the motocross the nations in Australia that year, Lyles would end up anchoring the team of LaRocco and Jeff Emmett, keeping Team USA's winning streak alive at 12 in a row. Billy Lyles, a name you sometimes forget when it comes to Grand Prix racing and American motocross. But in 1992, Billy was there and did a great job. And that's it for this week in motocross history. What do we got next, Jordan? Announcements from Golden Products is the sponsor of this segment. Jordan, what do we got up first? Oh, we're going to be talking about Golden Products. You heard me talking about Golden Products now for a couple of months. They were a sponsor with us a few months ago. They're seeing some results from the show. So... It came back as a sponsor again. This is the greatest little filter you're ever going to buy, whether it's for your mini, your modern bike, your vintage bike, your on-road bike, off-road, 
adventure bike, you name it. They're made of billet aluminum. They come in a variety of colors, including blue, orange, red, and silver. This filter can be cleaned indefinitely, and it will cut down to 10 microns of whatever is in that fuel or getting through your uh, fuel system in there, okay? 10 microns, you can't even see with your eyes. But anyway, you can take it apart indefinitely. You can clean it indefinitely. It's probably the last filter you're ever going to buy. And right now, Golan Products is actually looking for distributors. So be sure to get a hold of them at golanpro at yahoo.com. Elon Golan, thank you for all you do for our Sarah Vintage Motocross. Have a good day. Vintage Motocross Radio. There's no show this weekend, but we will be back on July 11th. But right now, I want to tell you that last week, the tables turned for me a little bit. And I was actually the guest on Vintage Motocross Q&A. Uh, Vintage Motocross Radio. I did that show from the Hummingbird's Nest down in Simi Valley. Warren Reed did a great job hosting the show. Asked me uh, a lot of questions and things that I had thoughts about when it came to restorations and motocross. And also asked me some personal questions too that I was happy to answer. So if you get a moment, go over to Vintage Motocross Radio and you can listen to Warren and I. The interview went on for about an hour and a half. I want to thank Warren Reed for being the guest host. And uh, I enjoyed being the guest that day. As I mentioned, there is a new show coming up on July 11th. My guest will be Nancy Payne. Nancy Payne, a very accomplished motocrosser and the first female national champion. So tune in July 11th at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, where my guest will be Nancy Payne. And while I'm thinking about it, and I didn't even get a chance to tell Jordan to make a slide or anything about it, I spoke to two people this week that are going to be, probably going to be guests on Vintage Motocross Radio in the future. One is NBA star turned vintage motocross enthusiast, Rick Smits. And the other one is Mark Barnett. I did have a little conversation with Mark Barnett today, and he did agree to do it. Rick Smits, uh, I did get his phone number, and he does want to talk to me about it. So stay tuned to Vintage Motocross Radio. You'll be hearing from possibly Rick Smits, but definitely Mark Barnett. Oh, my buddy Scott Burnworth. He doesn't ever stop promoting vintage motocross. He puts on some of the greatest races you'll ever attend. And it might be a little early, but I want to start talking about it now. October 16, 2021. SoCal Vintage MX Classic. The burner will be putting that race on. He always gets a lot of sponsors to put up money. And a lot of great prizes go out to all the people that show up. There's a lot of classes. So plan ahead. Get down there. Get Glen Helen. If they also feature, this is the second annual uh, running of the Marty Smith Memorial Cup. So... Be sure to put Burner's event on your schedule October 16th. Pacific Northwest Vintage Motocross has another event coming up. It's on July 11th at Pacific Raceway in Kent, Washington. I'm sure Jordan will be there for its Gunther and a whole host of other guys that are real popular up there in the Pacific Northwest. Where is Fritz Gunther these days? I haven't heard from him. Finish line brought to you by Northwest Mako DZ. What do they have going on there this week, Jordan? Ah, oh, the red frame chain tensioner brake torque arm combination. Just $84.95. This fits the red frame CZ. It's made in America. Just take a look at it. It's a beautiful piece, and it really does combine two things that you need in that bike. A good, strong brake torque arm, and of course, it will help with that chain slack that you might have a little bit of a problem adjusting. So, get over to Northwest Mako CZ, $84.95. Great job. Another product made by Alan Brown and made in America. Vintage Motocross hoodies and t-shirts are still available, just $19.99. They come in gray and white. Got the logo across the front, my autograph across the back. For just a couple of bucks more, you can get yourself a hoodie. Follow the link in the description online. What are yours today? Vintage Motocross Q&A sponsorship opportunities are still available. You can be seeing the same results that all of our sponsors here are getting. And we're reaching over 20,000 people a week. It's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, and it's going to be getting bigger. We've got some new segments coming up, and Jordan's going to be doing some editing on some events that we've been attending. And it'd be a really, really great time. If you wanted to get on board, I'll put something together that fits your budget, and we'll put something together for you where you can uh, get on Vintage Motocross Q&A as a sponsor. Jordan, I want you to hold the camera there or hold this slide for a second because I want to tell you guys something. You recognize this sign? Here you do. Nightmare Racing. They were a sponsor of ours a while back. And I just wanted to let everyone know that I did speak to Mark Hildebrand today. He's doing really, really well. And the purpose of me giving you this message, because I've talked about Mark before and that he is coming along nicely, is that he is doing some things with Nightmare Racing. So if you've had orders put there or you're thinking about placing an order, 
it's a great time to do it. Mark is feeling much better and he's taking care of some orders. And um, might I encourage you guys with Kawasaki's out there, even if you didn't plan on restoring one in the very near future, Mark was in a hospital for a hundred days, hundred days. I think if that happened to any of us, we, any of us, we would appreciate any help that anybody could give. So if you need some Kawasaki plastic, and you got some other cool stuff over there too at Nightmare Racing, go over and check them out online, show Mark some support. That is it for this week's episode of Vintage Motocross Q&A. Don't forget to go over to Vintage Motocross Radio. You can hear my, my uh, interview that was, uh, was uh, interviewed by um, Warren Reed. And in two weeks, we'll have Nancy Payne on Vintage Motocross Radio and uh, just a lot of great things going on. Thanks for joining me tonight. We'll see you next week. Gina! Come here. Come here, Gina. <laughs> Chicken. You got the blue chicken? Hey, James, it's a little hot. I'm a little tired.